I'm Dan Jones from the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and with me today is Dr. Bill Cushman, uh, who is at the University of Tennessee and the VA Medical Center there in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Cushman was a member of the steering committee and indeed the principal investigator for the VA portion of the SPRINT trial, which is what we'll be discussing today. Uh, Dr. Cushman, Bill, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for a great presentation this morning at the mm -hmm. Hypertension Council uh, meeting on the SPRINT trial. As I told you then, uh, I've heard several SPRINT presentations, mm -hmm. and this was the most comprehensive and the one that gave me the best understanding of hmm. where sprint falls in terms of the overall scope of blood pressure practice give us the elevator well, version you. of the importance of sprint if you will yeah so sprint of course compares a systolic blood pressure goal of less than 120 compared to a systolic blood pressure goal of less than 140 in people over age 50 who have elevated blood pressure, most of whom were on treatment when they came into the study, uh, and who were at higher risk so that we could do the study in less than 10,000 people as opposed to a much larger study. And, uh, and what the study did was to try and use a variety of different medications to lower the blood pressures and obviously use more medications in the intensive group. And what we found was that the study was actually stopped early because of substantial benefit. There was a 25% decrease in overall cardiovascular events, so myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, cardiovascular mortality, and acute coronary syndrome, although that by itself was not reduced. Um, and, uh, and also a 25% reduction, sorry, 27% reduction in all-cause mortality. So that one was a surprise to me. Was that a surprise to you, the, the reduction in all-cause mortality, especially since they stopped the trial early? That's right. And, and of course, one of the reasons it was stopped early was because of this benefit on all-cause mortality. Sometimes we'll see changes in all-cause mortality in trials that are not designed as that as the primary endpoint. And in fact, SPRINT was not considered to be large enough uh, to determine that. But the results were so much better than what we'd expected uh, that we saw that as well. Well, as you know, the, the American Heart Association <coughs> and the American College of Cardiology are working on our next national blood pressure mm -hmm. guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think this results of the SPRINT trial will impact the guidelines? Should they impact the guidelines? And should they impact clinical practice for the average clinician? Yeah. So my expectation is that it will. Of course, I'm not a member of that committee, even though I've been involved in committees before, like JNC7, JNC8, uh, as you have been. Uh, but I, I would anticipate that it's likely that it will impact the guidelines. Uh, I don't know exactly in what form, but I think in general the guidelines, uh, I think, should at least say that for high-risk individuals like we were studying in SPRINT, that we should aim for more intensive goal than the 150 we recommended in JNC8, or even the 140 that's been recommended pretty widely uh, in hypertension for many years. Uh, what exactly that pressure should be, uh, I think if we strictly go by the study, it should be 120, but that's assuming that we're not uh, treating everybody to 120, that we didn't get everybody below that, uh, and we did watch these patients very carefully. Uh, and it's also assuming that blood pressure is taken properly, and I think that's extremely important, that it makes a, a big difference how blood pressure is taken. So that one's really important for understanding the results of mm -hmm. the SPRINT trial, and you know, all of these large studies are criticized for one reason or another, mm -hmm. and at the recent European Society of Cardiology meeting there was criticism of the sprint trial mm -hmm. as I understood it because the blood pressure was measured so accurately now, which was <laughs> which was a surprise to me would, yeah. would, would you comment on this issue of blood <clears throat> pressure measurement and and what it means for the average clinician and what he should be doing in, in his office practice right so what people have to remember is that all the major clinical trials that determine what guidelines are recommending in terms of blood pressure goals and all of the major epidemiologic studies that also tell us what risk certain blood pressures have are all based on blood pressures taken in a very standardized manner using really the American Heart Association recommendations on how to measure blood pressures in humans. And uh, if you look across all the studies, there are a number of things that are in common, including using an accurate blood pressure machine, sphygmomanometer, uh, having some 
someone sit at least five minutes before the blood pressures are taken, not talking during that time, not talking during the blood pressure measurements, ideally taking multiple measurements and using proper cuff size. So all of that is, is common to the way blood pressures are taken in these studies. And it's interesting that the, um, uh, at the European Society of Hypertension that at least Dr. Chelson uh, brought that up as a, as a weakness of the study, and yet, their own guidelines, the European guidelines, as well as all the U.S. guidelines, have stressed the fact that in practice, we need to be measuring blood pressure accurately. And yes, it takes a little more effort, but it's really not difficult, and it's not something we should uh, expect not to be done properly. Just like we don't expect when we measure a glucose or a creatinine that it can be twofold difference uh, in what those results are. All right, as we close, let me see if I got the message just uh, from mm -hmm. both your uh, lecture this morning and then uh, our conversation today. Mm -hmm. uh, generally lower is better and uh, we'll, we'll let the guideline folks work through exactly how low we're going to recommend systolic mm -hmm. blood pressure be, but lower than we've been getting it likely mm -hmm. uh, in the 140 range. The SPRINT study showed not only that that's a better blood pressure but that it's feasible to get there with the, mm -hmm. the usual drugs. SPRINT used uh, common drugs. Uh, and, and the SPRINT study was more about how low to get blood pressure rather than which drug is better. Mm -hmm. uh, blood pressure measurement is really, really important, and that mm -hmm. five-minute resting period is an important part of that. Are all those okay? Yes, yes. And I think one other point that's important is that there's been a lot made about the adverse effects in SPRINT, and the intensive group had a little bit more, a percent or more, uh, adverse events in the intensive group, but overall adverse events were actually no different, including in those over age 75. Uh, you do have to watch people carefully, and there are things that happen that you have to make adjustments on. Uh, but in general, the, uh, the intensive intervention was tolerated even better than what we expected. Well, lots of good news from the SPRINT trial, mm -hmm. and uh, I wish you all well as you move forward with uh, getting blood pressure lower. Thank you, Dr. Cushman. Thank you.